you today is all about the party sector in South Africa. We have uh, not other than media and the still the area that with us, inflation and its spirit, uh, to, to speak to some issues. We also have Nisha Azul on the left, back and he will disappear, but uh, he'll be back soon. Yeah. There he is, he's taking a pen. Is that a selfie? No. Um, so, let's, let's begin. Yesterday we spoke about hip hop uh, and that consciousness, uh, sort of religion and black nationalist sort of issues on the African continent and, and, and links with the states. Today we continue that and speak specifically about this issue. The question we ask is what sort of subversive black nationalist work was already being produced by the time POC emerged in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, so the idea is to sort of quickly. Again, very reductive, very quick, very superficial, but quickly give you a quick sense of what that context was, what this gang down in Cape Town specifically, not exclusively but largely, our focus has largely been on Cape Town. <coughs> so, if you read work by an age of people, people like Mike Holden, uh, Dan Coughlin, um, if you look at the old staff flyer, journals, issues, black issues, you can see that a great amount of poetry, that amount of theatre, that amount of, um, of, of cultural activity was, was taking place. A lot of it was aligned with, with black consciousness uh, thinking, black nationalist objectives linked to the liberation struggle in some way. Even if not formally, uh, a lot of poets were speaking to the frustrations at the time and were using uh, cultural forms like theatre, uh, jazz, etc., etc., et poetry to speak to the moment. And um, of course, because on the continent, we've got a great tradition of orator and a portal performance. Um, we saw singing, we saw the documentary, a month for example. Uh, very interesting documentary. We see how protest songs you know, speak to, draw on the tradition of you know, the choral tradition on the continent. And it speaks to what is happening in that moment, motivates people. Uh, if you watch uh, a film called Mapan Sula, for example, you will know that in the fall, as detainees are being uh, you know, shoved into uh, overcrowded cells, the comrades in the cells in detention sing. En masse, they unite, they cut through those walls, they sing, they inspire each other. And this is how psychologically, on an emotional level, they can overcome the obstacles. There's this unity through the voice, through song. So that is the context. And of course, performance poetry then, and this goes without saying, performance poetry would play some kind of role. And of course, yes, LKJ, Amiri Faraka, a lot of things are happening outside of the country, but locally, Arisha, Arnold Poetry, performance poetry, plays poetry specifically as a very rich you know, history in this context. It makes sense then that a lot of subversive work would be performed by performance poets. Largely because you don't necessarily get in paper, you can walk into a venue without any subversive materials on you. Yes, in that context, you could be you know, arrested, chucked into jail for having a, ca a copy of Das Kapital on you. So in such a context, you're having bad literature on your person. Maybe having some poetry in your head is a good way to actually negotiate public spaces. So this is what people like Sabine Lidikane, Zwarte Ngure, and the second of the King, for example, the most famous, I think, of poets from that era, this is what they did. They didn't necessarily walk up with a pen and paper, they just performed their poetry. So that is the rich tradition. So we shouldn't be surprised then that hip hop artists also stepped into that equation and saw the sense of what MCs were doing. <coughs> I'd just like to give you a taste. Can you? Oh, good, you can read it. You can, yeah. You want me to make it my boss? I'll tell you, I'll to be two or three verses, stanzas from, from the poem uh, by Sabine Lee King. Do you know what conscientization programs were? What? Yes, South Africans were if you're old enough. Conscientization. To conscientize people, right? uh, to make them conscious, but also the spelling of the word, let me just go back, I'm sure I have it over there, at the bottom, conscientization. It's spelled in a way to draw attention to the word conscience. What is your conscience telling you? Is it part of right? Is it wrong? What, you know, what should you be doing about the situation? So consciousness, awareness, jazz, and pronouns, we're not call consciousness, awareness, you know, too many syllables, right? It doesn't flow to the tongue as, as, as nicely, they're called conscientization. Play on 
you know, the matrix to the word conscious, consciousness, black conscious, conscious of the world, typical consciousness, but they also conscience as in, you know, your ethical, your moral universe. And this is how I think these programs were able to capture the hearts and minds of young people, to mobilize them, youth, to charge of these things. It wasn't top down, it was from the genre, the dividing of 76 in Soweto, for example, and in, on these spots in the Cape Flats, all over the country, not just that. I lived in Davies Mead at the time. And that spot was done by kids. You know, some of them as young as 12, 11 years old. So, poetry, performance, singing was part of that story. And so this is the context within which Sandini became a very young Sandini became uh, participates in programs, dies in conscientization programs, and performs these poems. But this is the most famous poem of all before I even knew who Sandini was. I knew the poem of Wild Juice, right? From 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 Nani's and from word of mouth, etc. Et Let me read it out to you. Tell me if you can guess what Wild Juice is a metaphor for. But give me a chance to at least read the first stanza because I wish I had this poem. Shake, shake my comrade. Shake that invention of the working class. Shake that unified mess before it's too late. Shake before the time come to pass. Shake that wild juice. Throw, throw, Kabani. Throw that liquid of capitalist invention. Throw the blood of Sakani. Throw before they see your intention. Throw that wild juice. Dance, dance, my hero. Dance around the fire of resistance. Dance at the success of your throw. Dance because the dogs are still at a distance. Dance for that wild juice. Anyone have a guess? Let me keep going. Make, make my young lion make that wild juice. Make another one as strong as iron. Make many more until they beg for a truce. Make those many wild juices. Beg. Beg, you bastard. Beg that filthy, oops, beg that your filthy skin be spared. Beg that your blood does not flood. Beg because we have many wild juices stored. Beg those little dangerous wild juices. It's a metaphor for. Petrol bomb? Tell you. Petrol bomb. We obviously, from South Africa, we all know what you're doing. Get about my age, but. There you go, monitor cocktail, as it's only like the place that's just bottle, some petrol, gasoline for the Americans, a bag, and shake, throw, kaboom. Right, so that's the metaphor. An incendiary metaphor. Nice play on words. Um, so that is the mood of the time. Young people were ready to die. Uh, in the struggle against the party. They weren't just making posters and singing songs. All of the communication, all of the literature, all of the cultural performances were geared towards one thing, taking down the regime, to make the country ungovernable. And many people pay with, with their lives. Get the pizza is one of them. Mining is their own business, passing by, getting shot, right? Um, one of my schoolmates, um, Robbie Waterwich, um, planted some explosives at the Athlone Magistrate School, not far from me, not far from my school. The CCB, what is, it stands for the Civil Coordination Bureau, which is just a nice way of saying in the you know, National Intelligence Agency or CIA, the, 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 the apartheid equivalent of the CIA at the time, were involved in, in a number of dirty checks uh, in that context. And basically, what they did, I believe, they supplied comrades with great explosives, great limited mines. So when he said this thing up, this thing exploded and blew him and someone named Carl Lee Williams. Um, just in the knees. So this is how he died. Uh, I believe mean, he was a second year student at UWC at the time. First year, I'm not sure. Uh, I think I was in the trick. So this is the news my principal gathering us and saying to us, this is what happened to one of your school. It's one of the prefects of the school. Um, and warning us not to participate in his activities um, because he fears wild lives. So that's the context. So by the time we get to the late 80s, the early 90s, the tone is beginning to change. The shift was towards reconciliation. We must reconcile. We must call things now. So Zwaki had another poem called The Voice of Anger, for example. This one is called The Voice of Easy. So, whereas in another context, you might be stoking things up. 
in a native audience, you might want to control things down, right? Cool things down. And I know this is too small for you to eat, so I need to eat you. And I need to do, can I do it? Can I do my marketing to my voice? <laughs> Listen to the voice of reason. <laughs> Words of wisdom have to be uttered. A thin wall has to be built. Listen to the voice of reason. Now is the time to unchain the mind. Now is the time to unchain the time. Images of a new dream, images of a new society should be diffused. Harden the voice of reason. I used to have a much thicker voice. That's what happened to me. So I guess it's really deep voice. Really deep, sexy. So this is how we would perform, and repetition was a key part of what he did. And what he really did is well, oops. I think I might need another battery for this. Um, so what he did was was to actually um, lull you, seduce you with his voice. And much like Davos, like like Al K J, he actually had um, a, a band performing along with us. Do, do, do we have this cute up by any chance? Just give it a taste. So while this is going on, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, there was this big song, what is the song called with all of the pop musicians at the time? DJ Powers, yeah. Chico, oh, he can't sound, yeah. everyone like, we are the world. Yeah, yeah the buzzer, we are the world now. I forget the songs there, it was incredibly cheesy. Yes. But like, you know, yeah, we all love each other. Yeah. Just like African, we are the world equivalent, <laughs> whilst the townships were burning. And Ron Bosch, you know, the leafy white suburbs of Ron Bosch were basically um, unaffected. So while we were in a state of civil war, the song was being put out there, and this kind of poetry was being put out, and you can't get anything done. Right? So we see a shift in the discourse from the 80s to the 90s, from, you know, the incendiary wildness to a call for reason, for reconciliation, for reconstruction, which makes sense in principle, except that there were quite a few loose ends in that context that were not addressed satisfactorily. And one set of artists who thought that those loose ends needed to be addressed first was Prophets of the City. And as I said, Age of Truth was the album that got my attention, and this is a still. Oh, I see the lights are not that great. Ah. Yep. 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 I give it up. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Keep it in. This one. <laughs> I give it over to the experts. Of course, now I'm in shadow. Um, what I need to do tomorrow is can you all see that headstone? So, the Hector Peterson, August 1963, died June 1676. What they did, and this is a video I'll play you on Thursday in the panel discussion, is to really draw attention to what's wrong at that point in time. Just at the moment where there is a call for reason, for reconciliation, etc., etc. I think we need the lights again. Thank you. So, here's a song that I think I've seen a lot of people. I was in the English department at the time this album was out, and I was playing the music in the English department at the highest possible volume, disturbing the peace. And this song was called Dada Flex 3. It was the third version of the song that I had done before. The first version was really about gang violence, wasn't it? Yes. Um, to sort of address the social needs and the context and draw people's attention to how self-destructive behavior should be connected. Right? And addiction to drugs and, 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 and one and one, you know, black and black violence, as the media media called it. But this song was different. It was, it was kind of like that. It starts with, you know, you know, one of my mates got stabbed in the head, you know, etc., etc. So it sounds like that, I think, almost, the Bruji, yeah, the Bruji was a skit. The Bruji was a skit. It was a skit. But that was again, but that was again, but it was a bit. So it's a pretty graphic follow up to the first version of that, of that. And the thinking behind this version was um, we felt that we needed to go for the jungle, just ramp things up. Because the country was reaching such a, a, such a point 
on the one end there was extreme violence, on the one end, on the other end, you had the opposite extreme, people that just wanted to turn the blind eye and not really get involved. And out there was this, this you can't choose sides, you know, you're either going to be caught in the crossfire. And with regards to the various, we didn't want to do no clever wordplay and come up with the traditional things that MCs do. We just decided we're going to write the song and, and just go at it as hard as we possibly could to describe exactly what was going on because we were dealing not only with the political situation, we were dealing with a spiritual, mental, um, sort of, if you want to call it, term of breakdown because that was how deep the divide was in this country and that is our strategy what we would view the enemy, you know, that's how deep they would go to make sure that our communities were totally dysfunctional as well and kind of getting to grips and learning about the chemical warfare strategies that were put in place with uh, guns being um, uh, placed into, the, in, into our communities our drugs would be filtered into the communities our gangs would be used as hitmen and informants for the previous apartheid government as well so you're starting to, to learn about all these things and of course that blows up in frustration as well and at the same time as all those things are taking place we are now touring and we're now learning that the CCB we viewed them as the previous apartheid government's hit squads they were practically going out and they were assassinating people and at this time we decided we to arm ourselves so we were in and out of gun shops buying whatever weapons we could find making sure we had the shooting ranges being fully armed because we were touring a lot as well and we were actually set to go to Putuswana and knowing that Putuswana was one of the puppet states we needed to, to be well prepared because now we were kind of venturing into AWB territory as well because the AWB they were ramping up uh, their strategy and they were ramping up um, if you want to call it their um, uh, their counter attacks on their side as well. So we had to take all of those things into consideration and when you come home or you're dealing with people in your community you still realize man there's so much damage being done. What are you going to do just to create an awareness to wake people up? How? So this you could practically say this is a musical petrol bomb right here. So that's the best way I can describe it. And on that note, let's give it a taste. Note the consonants, the flow of consonants. This is good. Get in there and just do what needs to be done. We didn't know, you know, 
what that, the, the final outcome would be. We just went strictly on emotion at the time, and you know, this was the result of it. So Lily came and you think, you might, you don't have to understand it because it actually sounds kind of rough, it sounds rough, it sounds noisy. Uh, the sort of production style is, is geared towards that. So on an aesthetic level, noise is being created, but also validity, noise is being created. Right? Gestures of refusal. Um, my terminology for the week. So the first verse takes up the scene. Violence, people fighting with each other about stupid stuff. Someone gets stabbed, a, broke, a bottle gets broken over someone else's head. Before you know it, the cops rock up. And you know, what's going to happen? You get to go to jail. The magistrate will make you pay for all of this. So basically, self-defeating minds. What is the real issue that needs to be addressed? Fast forward to the last verse. Don't take FW puzzle you for this. We don't let FW declare who was the last president of the not so big Italian South Africa. He's the one who, who negotiated uh, the deal with the ANC. Um, and the POC's response was, don't be fooled by FW. Don't take any puzzle you. You want to just play that piece Of what POC used to call, in their context, hometown. 
the non-standard value of Afrikaans in English. And of course, stereotypically, colored identity, in particular markers of colored identity, we use to position various black people, right? And of course, the way in which people on the Cape Flats speak Afrikaans, right? Khamta, the language of Han, Kham, Han, basically. Uh, the language of the sons of Han. It, it, it basically takes you back to the story of miscegenation, the shame of miscegenation. Miscegenated people speak this bastardized language. Make up your mind, it's either English or it's Afrikaans. It can't be both. And you have to speak the standard dialect of that language, right? So when you went to school, even if you were Afrikaans speaking, when you went to school, you were totally confused. Because the Afrikaans that you're being taught at school, that you're being told will get you a job, will get you educated, that version of Afrikaans did not reflect your own lived experience. It didn't validate your own personal experience. So already you were at a loss. And if you speak that non-standard dialect, which you were born into, it automatically marks you the language mark you. What POC did is to embrace that non-standard dialect, right? Uh, more recent artists would call it Afrikaans. If you kneel of black noise over here, they talk about Afrikaans and, and the theory of project. The then that is makes interesting form about, about Afrikaans. Well worth getting, it's called Afrikaans. So get the DVD. Um, you would say that um, what we need to do is reclaim that history. And it's ironic, I mean, this is 1993. That was your message. You were addressing Khamta to sort of position yourself as black and retrieve the mark of shame from that neocolonial discourse. That it's, it's fine to speak Cape Flats dialects. Um, you, can, you can do that and be black at the same time, of course. Because knowing the, the, the language and this non standardized form of Afrikaans borrows from so many different languages, including African languages, Khoi languages, there's Malay in there, of course, there's traditional Dutch in there as well. So it's a it's an ever evolving language at the later stage. We released an album called Ghetto Code, and Ghetto Code is all about the language and knowing how we speak and how things. It's a very vibrant language as well because if, for instance, we spoke about yak yesterday. You know, yak at that time compared to yak today it's, it means something totally different. It's kind of moved on, and what we were trying to say to the Ghetto Code as well, the way we speak. You can only understand it, really feel the worth, the value, and the depth of the language if you are in that community. You see, you feel the joy, the pain, and you experience the day-to-day -day, you know, that those communities go through. That's the way you can truly get a sense of the power of the language. And we were trying to hint, you know, we should actually use the language as a form of code because you know, that, that's what we had to our advantage because let's say for instance somebody coming from a, a very sort of different background still speaking Afrikaans and this is kind of what happened in prisons we can have a whole conversation in Afrikaans to the one person that might mean something but to the two that's actually exchanging conversation it's a completely different conversation that we're using words that the other person sort of can relate to but the context in which it's being used it's very different, so it's like a form of code. It's a very sort of deep form of expression, if you want to call it that. Parallel discursive universes, double coded speech, uh, links with double consciousness. Just for those of you, if you, if you missed yesterday's lecture, that's what we spoke about yesterday. Just do not me if you missed it. Uh, I'm reminded at this point of the late Mr. Fat, uh, co founding member of the crew that, 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 that uh, D started as well, Drasa um, Brothers of the K, Rasa mm -hmm. um, The first interview I did with him, we were in the car outside Dee's house in just place doing this with a, let's just talk and I'll record it. And, and we were going to Dee's house and we'll talk again. And it was five hours later, we were still talking. But one of the, one of the landmark things that he said to me was like, you know what, this mission, what is Rasa Banika put out, like the black pairs to be out to prove that Ham is legal. You know, and if I were to translate that into Academic speak. They're validating the negated sign of blackness. Blackness is negated. Coloredness is negated. Right? And color is separate from black. It needs to be dislocated. If we can rule people, they they all need to be, be, be tribalized in some way. You saw the same thing happening with people who were born in Cape Town 
was not speaking that, he still wasn't speaking. And people were like, we need to get back home to the Eastern Cape. I was like, I was born here. You know? So the Eastern Cape, that's for the Corsa speakers. Uh, if you speak Zulu, you go to KZN, that's where your people are from. But like, dude, I was born in the Free State. I was born in Cape Town. Like, you know, that's not how it works. You need to tribalize, you need to dislocate and de aggregate people. You can't have a tribalization which always already goes down. You can't allow that to happen. So all of those myths about racial purity and the purity of the language, of the purity of the culture, the history, that is what the party was trying to do. And what artists like, you know, they're not alone, but like certainly the DC inspired artists who are trying to do so say, well, that all of that is socially constructed. There's no biological basis for that. And it's, it's no wonder that, you know, a few decades later, geneticists have uh, proven that that thing that comes with natural things is so minuscule, it's so arbitrary. So, you know, then, now, now, at last, if you're biologically extensionist, you know, proof at last to the hogwash that is race. Um, it's mostly constructed, it's socially constructed, it's highly ideological. So basically what they do then is they claim they describe Hang Tao and the innocent word. They take that signifier Hang Tao, they inhabit it and flip it over. You know, this is deconstruction before deconstruction. Um, if you look at Hindu Lewis Gates' work, you'll see that, that, that he was making sense of what people were doing when they were signifying and playing in dozens. That's what they were doing. They were deconstructing the colonial, the slave master's language. And this is long before Jacques Derrida existed, or Foucault, etc., etc. It's deconstruction before deconstruction. Right? Um, so that's the bigger picture. Do we have time for this? Mm, 30 minutes, 25 minutes. Can I do a quick detour? I just want to take a solo again okay, because I don't have the main part background. I come from a live music performance background. I play lead guitar, so I want to take my solo now that you've all the time. So um, let me fill in my distortion pedal, my delay, and take you off on the mission. Just remind, let's just remind ourselves of the context. Remember, I spoke about deindustrialization with the emergence of people yesterday, right? The collapse of the factory in Detroit, that place that gave us Eminem. Um, the same thing was going to happen in South Africa. Right. Picture that you are the family of, let's just say your father is, uh, let's just say your father's unemployed or, or dead, or not that really employed, but your mother has a regular day. She works at Queen's Park in Salt River. She's a garment worker. Let's use that as well. During apartheid, the cool thing about being classified white and colored is that you had certain advantages, right? That's how they separated people. So if you were in Cape Town, if you were a woman classified as colored, you probably get work, could get work in the garment industry, for example. So you could work at Pink Spark, with it's true for etc., etc. And um, it meant that if you lived in the place like Mandenberg, that not just morally, but financially, you would the main state of your family. So there were a lot of star women who had regular jobs and men were not doing so well, it, although you could access work in places like the city council, etc, etc. So it's still very, very limited. You couldn't go off and become the CEO of, of True Works, but that's the role that we are there in. So that's what's protected important because people of certain kinds of racial categories would fall away and a large part of the economy would bottom up. The garment industry in Cape Town would soon bottom up, bottom up because what was negotiated behind closed doors while CODESA was going down in the early 90s, everyone is focused on CODESA. The National Party, the ANC, negotiating the future of the country, the you know, civil war going on, everything's going to collapse, what's going on? No one's really looking at what other people in the ANC, you know, everyone's looking at Rolf Mayer of the National Party and civil war also. No one's looking at what, say, Zulu and the are doing. They and a few other uh, colleagues were engaged in economic negotiations, which actually had started well before Nelson Mandela had been released. Started in the 80s, right? So we had the federal party, we had off to go talk to this delegation and hoo-ha about the soccer, all that stuff, getting down. That, you know, it's, the story is bigger than that. Um, so in the end, what happens is that the new minister of finance would be, you know, would be schooled by none other than Chris Stoltz, for example. A whole lot of people who were 
in charge of driving the Kanyala, the major corporates, uh, who actually owned the country in terms of mineral wealth, financial industry, etc., etc. These were the people negotiating with the ANC. And these are the people who would make, they would be king makers. So all of the BEE billionaires that you know of today, they come from that era. That's how they got made. Certain comrades were deployed. And these are the billionaires you see today. So we see this sort of elite minority, elite black minority being co-opted from the ANC so that we ensure that economically our policies stay the same. In actual fact, the policies don't just stay the same, that they embrace, our, we embrace neoliberal economics. Right? We embrace an economic policy that ensures that outside investors, a range of, of players in and outside the country who have financial interests in the country, that the interests are not disrupted, that everything remains stable. And we're all on Medeva, you know, we're all riding on Medeva fever, and it's all wonderful that everyone's relieved, oh, Nelson Dali did not come up and kill everybody, attack our land, and nationalize everything. It's lovely, Medeva's wonderful, great, yes, he is wonderful. 27 years, I can't do that. Right? And come on, loving everybody. But the story that Manana himself could not have anticipated is what the ANC in exile was doing without his permission, without his knowledge. One of the first things he came out when he came out and sort of made a speech, he went on and on about nationalization. People were like, oh shit. Right? And the markets went all jitty. The markets, no, you're not telling the markets. Come on the side of the MND, I need to talk to you. This is what's really going on. And you need to just play along. Right? So he got redirected. Right? So this is what's going on. So we see the emerging elite ensuring that, that, that uh, you know, white minority interests, corporate interests are not upset. So it's really fun for me. It's like something like the region of the earth. The pitfalls of national consciousness, specifically in that chapter. Right? It's post colonial African state, the emerging elite, the intelligentsia, lead the way, and what do they do? They sell the people out. Right? And you see this rise of, of Ethno-nationalism, and before you know it, places like that because you've got xenophobic violence, people being killed because they're foreigners, African foreigners, not the German white folk right, visiting. The African foreigners getting expelled, Ivory Coast, that was going on. I don't was writing about that. And that's what we have about like, you know, black foreigner in this country, you're not that welcome. Ethno-nationalism is on the up, and this particular version of the ANC uh, has been has been pushing that agenda. This is real ethno-nationalist thing which, which goes against the non-racial politics of ANC, its history. So, this is what's going on. So you've got this elite minority, this black elite, serving big capital. And I think we have a term for how this works. They call it empire. And it's just a code for global capitalism. It's how does global capitalism work? It's not coercive necessarily if it doesn't have to. It uses methods of persuasion, um, works through multilateral organizations like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, which push emerging economies to embrace new economics, uh, structural adjustment programs, which see to it that, that you know, access to those local markets, that exchange controls, a lot of these things are actually in favor of, say, US investors. And the argument is that the economy will grow if you get foreign direct investment. Right. And our new Minister of Finance, Jake Emanuel, is responsible for developing an economic policy for gear, gear, paint, everything on foreign direct investment. If we relax everything, invite foreign investment, foreign direct investment, that everything will just be wonderful and people will get jobs and it will work. But it hasn't. Gear has had its time and it's failed. It hasn't worked. What we now see is hundreds of service delivery protests around the country and people getting killed to say, oh, we don't have water, we're thirsty. And you know, police brutality all over the country, serious failures of the state on all sorts of levels, partly because of poor economic policy and because this, the government on a local level did not do anything which might upset foreign investors, the threat of pulling investment. What does this have to do with the garment worker that I spoke about? The moment you relax you know, controls over markets and you don't control too much about who comes up in from outside and goals up land. Uh, you don't control outsourcing that process. It goes through with a whole lot of clothing companies to stick with the garment industry. For example, they would now, instead of going to the garment factories 
he sold them in the main dome, then he gets like cheaper from China and India and Bangladesh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. They're all now, you know, it's part of the outsourcing paradigm. So what happens in those industries, they're not protected, those local blocks are not protected, so the jobs fall, there's no work for those aunties working there. So the main space that they were in their homes, that whole equation collapses. That's, that's your issue, that's the problem. So schools have been getting retention. Over the last 10, 15 years, people have been retention, partly because of how this works. So the government is failing its citizens, its citizens can't get work. Local markets might be protected, be told, oh, no, you don't do that, that's, that's communism, and you protect local markets. And of course, the back action is funny, that's what the state does to its own markets, protects it viciously. So basically, the sovereignty of the nation state is undermined, right? In favor of those investors out there. But there's, there's no quid pro quo, there's no give and take. So, in a way, let me just skip the head because I won't theorize too much. The question is is this, we come back to this whole thing. You might say that South Africa is measuring itself by the tape of empire. The IMF, the World Bank, all these multilateral institutions tell it what its government's strategy should be, what its economic policy should be. Um, but it doesn't benefit us, and it aspires to those goals. And the World Cup is a good example of that. We can host the World Cup. We can host this wonderful example that will benefit our people. But at the end of the day, FIFA and its key sponsors benefit. Informal trainers who thought they could make a living off of the World Cup were pushed away from that general area. They couldn't access that space. They couldn't train there. Right? People selling clothes, curios, youth out. We have our preferred partners and they will make money and we don't care about you. So that's the biggest story. So in a way, you know, designed to prove that we could host the World Cup and do this mega event, and we did, we pulled it off. We actually shot ourselves in the foot. Well, we need shot the working class and the bees, didn't make a good amount of money about it. So, so, were they correct? They were correct. Was profits, were POC correct? They were, but they were correct in ways they could not anticipate. They could never imagine how uh, neoliberalism would really assault the country and how the elites would get co opted, that the new blackies would get, get co opted and actually facilitate that process to their own benefit at, at the expense of others. So, that's the, the background to ancient truth. I'm just sort of like the to sketch a scenario and just those comparisons. This is why I'm super, super interested in this album and this moment, 1993, when this album gets back. And we will look at the censorship issues behind Asian Truth on Thursday in the panel discussion. We won't talk about economic policy that much. We can, but we'll talk about censorship and the dangers of censorship in this context. That's what we're going to do. But for the moment, I want to take a moment they're just allowed to enjoy something which isn't in your face incendiary. I want to talk about D and his own writing and how his own personal experience with the sample and linguistic six. It wasn't all throwing a fist in the air kind of stuff. It was also intensely personal and aesthetically pleasing. So I'd like, if you don't mind, I'd like us all to play Ali Linguistic Six. And this is piece of the last verse and we'll just so it's best you can allow me to speak to you. Yes, you know why? It's an English word speak, so... Ik is vanuit die vers 6, hij is wat ik ook goed hier in district 6 in zee. The lockdown and outside the streets, and over the street and the street and the market of this room of music was always the heartbeat. I remember the days in this week six, the sound of the street horn and the owen just to blow with the little song, the first of what the pain and the cut is to collect scrap iron. As a light, I was crying in my wood, there was a tragedy, but didn't have a vanity. I used to take a cell plunk, get up in what they spent in sunlight, so sell down the opposite street. This is the heart and soul of the young and old without this. Six feet in the cold. Now and then my father used to wear a bright sun. This used to jump in the flat and then go the whole back. For creeping snook, or let's go to take a look. I remember the cool cats on the hook and how the monsters used to fluke when they get the hook. And we used to have competitions to see who had the loudest loop. And we had problems with the group. And my mama used to scout from the group saying, Yalla, pura mut loop.
I used to go to school and sort of bloom and my cousins used to go to church coping. I remember the whole thing as if it was yesterday and the way we used to play. Oh, but in it, oh, but in it, go and worry, bro. School, Lulu and Kenzie, every weekend we used to go to the mountain to fix down the baller. I remember the high school and how we used to skip, got this in cup tall while the girls got on this in netball. I remember Sabu looking at the Mati premium and we became the needy, the neighbors would always keep the door open. In times of hardship, surviving in District 6 was hard work, but we would always depend on the labor support. So I'm taking it back to the back door, up an extra strip in the seven steps. When the maids are slept, you're in summer when the fence just kept open, yeah. But yeah, was out in bar, we had clothes and long arm, we used to slap luck with the latest and fast trap, we used to jet the ice cream pack, got set the acht in the yard, and, and, and put scallops in a hole. This is the heart and soul of the young and old Without District 6 we are the cold This is the heart and soul of the young and old Without District 6 we are the cold The sun took a dust of the bay, what could it be? I never knew we were gonna lose Up a separate street, 75 and 73 Put that cooler anti-posey, not to marry And the better shaky, or where we were going to stay 78 to 79, was part your food and drink My favorite time, I remember saying We were gonna scrap irons, and now we used to mine So we're gonna look at the stuff in We used to find old boys and all your mice Like mice that threw us on the cake flags And it all happened when my father ended on his bed Do you know what inspired that and where that came from? 
I have an interview, a recent interview with Shahid and, and, and Nidhi. I'm into that clip where Shahid speaks to some aspects of the experience because he is back in Canada, he can't, can't be here. Shahid is going to do that on video. But then the person we directed and edited understand what I'm coming from. I understand conditions under which she says this mission has to be completed. We can talk about that. So we'll have two, so we'll have three video clips, about three minutes each, and then a free fall with our way of over here. Thanks so much.